this is what everybody's searching for. Hello friends. Today, we're going to be reviewing some of your questions about Tesla Fancy. What we wanted to do was, this was Tony's idea. We got a lot of questions on the comment section of the videos. Now, if you really want your question answered and it's something to do with a complex thing or a drug or especially something that other people can benefit from, ask your question there. But if we miss it, please consider going to my Instagram. The, I always have a latest post about Q&As. Even if it looks old to you, I'm always reviewing this post. So consider putting your comment there also. We're going to take some questions here. We divided them into questions related to stacking or combining tesafensine with other chemicals for, well, let's find out what for. I haven't even read them yet, but they should be interesting. So, so the first question is, would tesafensine, ephedrine, caffeine, and carterine be a good fat loss stack? So all those things together. So let's take them one by one. The main problem you have is that tesafensine's primary health risk is the r r rise in cardiac activity. Your heart rate rises when you're on tesofensine due to dopaminergic and adrenergic signaling. Remember, Not as much as things like clenbuterol or hardcore stimulants, but well, still. Clenbuterol is clearly cardiotoxic and like ruining people's hearts when they use it. But tesofensine was compared instead against things like semaglutide. Most original, other than DNP, which was the first approved fat loss drug in the US, most of them increase heart rate notably because they affect the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight nervous system through hormones that govern it, like adrenaline and dopamine. Tesafensine, if you remember, inhibits the reuptake between the basic cells of your brain neurons. It inhibits the reuptake of chemicals that are sent to the other neuron to change its activity, including serotonin, noradrenaline, and dopamine. Now, it's the activity of dopamine 1 receptors and alpha-1 adrenaline receptors that causes the inhibition of appetite from tesofancy. So, first, so what I wanted to talk about is that caffeine increases heart rate also. Oh, 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 God, wow. Over five cups of caffeine are known to worsen cardiovascular health long-term. So this is a concern. Generally, when you increase your heart rate, what happens is, especially if you're prone to growth from your heart or you're exercising, your heart grows and loses some of its anatomical structure as it grows. Also, it do, sometimes develops like fibrotic elements, scar tissue within it, and so on, as found in autopsies of ultramarathon runners. You don't, and also there's this idea that your heart is just a muscle, and the less times it beats maybe successfully in life without major anatomical changes to become so much bigger, like a Tour de France uh, cyclist, is probably means you have a longer lasting heart. So that's the main issue there. Now, as Tony said, the heart rate increase is not something like that you would be thinking of with clenbuterol or with ephedrine or potentially with caffeine. But I would not want to combine tesofensine with another stimulant that defeats sort of the purpose of it. The purpose of tesofensine is it doesn't cause dopamine transmission, so it's less addictive than amphetamines. But like Ritalin, it inhibits the reuptake of dopamine and the reuptake of noradrenaline quite potently, dopamine being around 65% inhibited through the, that, the transporter, and noradrenaline higher, maybe 70 to 80%. Now, for, for reference, methylphenidate Ritalin inhibits the reuptake of dopamine by about 70 to 80%. So it's a bit more powerful, there's about 65%. But it's still quite significant. Why is it not more powerful? The risk of the cardiac complications, as well as potentially addictive risk, rise when you inhibit the dopamine transport more. So they settled on 65 here. In fact, researchers are looking for the, what they call triple reuptake inhibitors that do it less, but this would be more successful. That's offensive because of 65%. Adrenaline also inhibits, as I said, through the alpha adrenaline receptor appetite. Serotonin doesn't. The purpose of having serotonin there, usually this is for, for uh, as an antidepressant, but in this case, it protects you from dopamine neurotoxicity in the brain. Unlike the inhibition of dopamine and noradrenaline, inhibition of serotonin reuptake potently increases neurogenesis. So it can be helpful for the brain, at least insofar as it's protecting it from the stimulatory effects of dopamine and adrenaline. So my point is, I wouldn't combine it with a stimulant of any kind. In fact, if you wanted to have an ideal stimulant for this effect, it may be something like Ritalin. I've always said this. Ritalin seemed to inhibit my hunger more than amphetamine. It has, it seems, more of a noradrenergic effect in some way, maybe just due to the lack of direct dopamine transmission. But it also seems, man, eh, maybe, milligram per milligram. But also people use higher milligrams of Ritalin. For me, it's more stimulatory. The difference is there, you don't have the protection of serotonergic inhibition. If it was long-acting, Concerta, which caused me once un accidentally to lose a dramatic amount of weight, 
If it was, and you don't have the serotonergic inhibition, this potential sleep insomnia, potential anxiety development is all much more severe. Mm. So ignore ephedrine and caffeine. Cardrine has no cross contraindication. Contra negative. Yeah, it has no molecular significant. Not at least, at least not significant. It probably sh surely does because the PPR delta receptor or beta receptors expressed throughout the body. There is a chance that if you use cardrine for too long, basically what you're promoting is healing elements in the body. By the way, PPR receptors, the target of cardrine, also the receptors that are the target of telmisartan and also the target of fibrates, which are kind of cholesterol medication with a lot of side effects. That's the alpha, the gamma, and the delta receptors. They're involved in lipid metabolism, but they also, the delta one in particular, promotes pro-growth factors in the body. And this means you recover better, but potentially in the long term, you could have a higher cancer risk. I don't think it's a major risk to the point where I'm taking it right now. And that's another thing I'm, I think I'm taking that's the most risky in the short term. Okay, so tesafensine combined with other stimulants, we have a risk of too much stimulants. So because the ephedrine and the caffeine are also causing adrenaline and noradrenaline and dopamine to increase. And then the tesafensine is a reuptake inhibitor, right? So now you have too much dopamine, too much adrenaline. Yeah. And this is the risk. The crux of the risk though is the heart. The direct modulation of the heart rate meaning you could develop an arrhythmia like some people do from using thyroid medication, clenbuterol, but more importantly, that the long-term rise in the heart rate, if you use this medication for two years or three years, could make your heart grow a little bit or something like that. So, so I'm not using ephedrine while I'm on tesafensine, but I am having small amounts of caffeine and it's amplifying, the tensofensine is amplifying the effects of caffeine. A small amount of caffeine goes a lot, it has a lot more significant feeling to it. It may be the inhibition of the enzymatic uh, metabolism of, of caffeine. Mm. I should mention that there is a stream of research from the last three years or so combining tensofensine with the inferior beta blocker, metropolol. Metropolol is lipophilic, more select, which means it gets into the brain easily, but it's more selective between other receptors in general than propranolol is it's much less selective than nebivalol. Nebivalol is very selective of the cardiac-specific adrenaline receptors. There are others that are in the cardiac system, but it's specific to those. So what we have been doing is we've been combining desofensine always with nebivalol. In my case, I doubled my nebivalol dosage to 10 milligrams. Nebivalol is also 24-hour acting, so that's very valuable because desofensine is also 24-hour acting. In fact, I really question why the authors of those studies, maybe they're not so familiar with beta blockers, should have probably trialed it much easier with nebivalol. So my stack, like if I'm going to try to accomplish what this person is trying to accomplish, but I, I'm personally doing... Should we go through the rest of them first? I think we're, this video is going to be so long just going through this one. Maybe we need to do a separate video on okay. the separate okay. one. Yeah, um, because, I, because like the real world take home of this is like how to adapt the what we're trying to accomplish with that stack with... A healthier approach that's less risky yeah. than the heart. So, so, so real quick, real quick. What, I'll say what I would say. Okay. So, ahead. first of all, if I was taking tesofensine for appetite suppression, I would be taking nebivalol to protect my heart, and I would be taking naltrexone to exaggerate the effects of tesofensine on appetite suppression. Then I could consider beyond that because these have a particularly synergistic effect. So I would probably not take it without naltrexone, to be honest with you. I mean, it's very valuable. This should be a low-hanging fruit. But then is the issue, do you want to affect the GLP-1 uh, system, or even more interesting, the, there are hybrid GLP-1 and GIP uh, agonists. But the GLP-1 agonists, liraglutide, duloglutide, semaglutide. I was using, if I recall correct, or correctly, I think I was using duloglutide. The da daily injection is duloglutide, right? Do you recall? Mm. But it's been over a year and a half. That one, I mean, for me, it was very interesting. These, these different gut hormones inhibit different kinds of hunger slightly differently. But to be honest with you, it was very powerful for me. And keep in mind, that will not affect your cardiac rate or dopamine toxicity, things like that. So the naltrexone won't, the GLP-1 agonist won't. Uh, there are other things that are being researched like uh, oxytocin and like uh, FGF-21 and other potential mechanisms. There are things you could do to increase your metabolism now, not your appetite. So, like, I would potentially consider 50 milligrams of DAP. But I want to make sure this is clear. Tony and I disagree. We do, Tony's more adventurous with DAP doses. But, but I am concerned about, like, very minuscule cell death from overheating. And I'm also, more than that, I don't think it'll happen at 50, but I'm also not willing to not function mentally so poorly, like, be so lazy just to lose fat. So I, and I don't think anyone should be. So that's why I say 50. You barely notice it. And it's almost certainly not having a net negative. It's reducing oxidative 
Diamonds on your balls. So we'll do a whole video for you guys on how Leo would versus I would use the DP fat burner along with tessafenzine and the risks and, and benefits to doing that. And then, and then, of course, the question is, do you want to use thyroid medication? The problem is thyroid medication also directly has impacts on cardiac rhythm. But there is a drug that's very expensive called GC1. GC1 is a selective thyroid receptor agonist that agonizes thyroid receptors that are less commonly found in the heart, in the cardiac muscle. So if you could get your hands on that, like cardarine and like, and like uh, DNP and like growth hormone, you would increase the growth hormone, not MK677. You would increase fat, maybe MK also and GH, HGH frag, but you would increase your metabolism without affecting that heart rate, which is sort of like, uh, I don't know how they describe it, but this is what everybody's searching for in research. They're searching for appetite suppressants that don't cause heart rate issues and anxiety, which mm -hmm. comes from dopamine issues. So, so sticking with what I think uh, the comments goal is with this stack, I'll tell you what I would do differently and that I, I would actually do this if I'm going to try to shred down really quickly. But this isn't all the things I would take. I'm just trying to replace what he wanted to use with something I think that's better, safer, more effective. And uh, I'd use the tesafensine with the nibivalol like we're doing. I take five milligrams of nibivalol every day. And the tesafensine is one pill, which is half a milligram, which is 500 micrograms. Uh, I would use synephrine and yohimbine. Now, synephrine and yohimbine raise the heart rate. Yohimbine can alter your heart rate also. Some people can get an irregular heart rate. So you have to feel how comfortable you are. There's with no it. sense putting in a cardiac thing. This is reckless. I mean, the problem if you don't is. don't care about dying, do that. If I, if I need to get from 9% body fat you to 6% body fat, I can't do it without an incredible amount of suffering or yohimbine. Like that's like, Does I don't know how to do that suppression you mean or? No, for yohimbine to access that stubborn body fat, oh, okay. to get rid of that last little bit of lower ab fat. Oh, I should say that I wouldn't do this if I was, uh, you know, 20% body fat. They wouldn't I've, seen, I've seen people on, on 20 IU of GH that cannot gain fat. Super subcutaneous fat. They just can't. Cannot gain fat, but they still have a hard time losing that last little bit of stubborn fat. Do you know what I'm talking about? The look I'm talking about, the 20 unit GH people? Was Trevor, did that, did Trevor have any stubborn body fat? I bet not. No. Yeah, eventually, years on end, it does not. Uh, but yeah, I'm just yeah. saying, there's a potential yeah. other way. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. That's, I don't that, think you have That's true, it's true. And yeah. keep in mind, Pro if hormone. you don't get, a, don't get an arrhythmia or don't get a heart attack when your heart yeah. rate's irregular or fast, keep in mind, something may slightly happen where you just got damage in your heart. That never is replaceable and just changed the integrity yeah. of your heart. So I'm just saying this because. There are people who watch this who will be less careful than I am, naturally, mm -hmm. and I want you to understand this is a risk. It's about the dosage. You know, the higher the dosage, the more risk. And like a low dosage, I don't feel anything on my heart from Yohimbine, but a high dosage, my heart will start skipping beats. Well, let, let me put it to you this way. Your goal, if you want to lose weight without hurting your heart, just completely, should be that your resting heart rate before you lost weight is at least equal to after. Mm. So your resting heart rate hasn't went up as you're losing weight. Your, your workout heart rate should go, go up, but actually your resting heart rate should in, with it, almost within weeks go down. If it's yeah. not going down, there's something funky going up. Because we're on nebivolol, we're kind of hijacking that whole... You're on nebivolol before. before. Oh, like nebivolol before. Well, okay. As opposed to adding it in when you start the fat loss and then... Yeah. yeah. Know, well, we're on nebivolol already. Always on nebivolol. Measures. But if you're yeah. not, you would want to start it a little bit before. It's not going to massively affect your blood pressure. It's just your heart rate. You can see, and then you can start the next day. And then synephrine is one of the other um, fat burners that I don't notice much in impact on my heart. Like even at 50 milligrams, I don't, I don't see any heart rate increase, any irregular heartbeat, anything. And yet that's that dosage, which is considered, I think, a fairly high dosage, is extremely effective for burning the stubborn body fat. Because with the tesafensine, we have... Definitely our metabolism speeds up. Body temperature increases. We have less appetite. But it's about, for me, getting rid of the stubborn body fat. They're really hard to reach body fat. Okay, so growth hormone, yohimbine, synephrine, these are the things that personally so, I stack with it in order to get rid of the stubborn body fat, not just the fat off the arms. And So body. the second drug you mentioned is an adrenaline receptor agonist. Is it used for, like, uh, asthma? Synephrine? Yeah. 
I don't know what it's clinically used for. I don't know what it is exactly, but it sounds to me like it increases heart rates. I can almost guarantee that that's the case. Do, do a deep research on it because it's shocking how effective it is at fat no, loss I've, I've come compared up. to the minimal impact on heart, compared to ephedrine, caffeine, you know, all the different other stimulants. Well, let's be clear that clenbuterol has more of an effect on the heart than salmeterol, not salbuterol. Salmeterol is the most selective agonist. I don't know why everybody's still using clenbuterol. It's because somebody in China hasn't decided there's enough of a market to produce this one for $30,000 and then everybody else will copy it. Mm -hmm. This one is a much more effective one, doesn't have a much worse half-life, nothing. It's yeah. just Dan Vichin was not comprehensive in those days. It was already available also, he just made a mistake. So there are, if you want to use the adrenal agonist, I don't know this drug so I can't comment on it, but again, the whole point of this is you're now affecting your heart rate and your appetite from the same mechanism. You could have affected your heart rate from plan combined with semaglutide, and it would just be heart rate and metabolism. Here you're getting heart rate, so metabolism also a little bit, but mainly you're getting, because it's mainly psychological, appetite suppression. Mm. So the only way to protect yourself is not to use the most dangerous drugs for fat loss. You, can, you finally can just eat less also if you want to lose fat. And there's, thank God, because of the GLP-1 agonist, a major, major, and there will be more in the future, major, major alternative. So you should be able to inhibit your appetite completely with uh, GLP-1 agonist mm. and desofensine and naltrexone. The issue then is speeding up the metabolism. As I mentioned, you have GC1, you have growth hormone, which won't kill you in a year, usually. I don't think it, I mean, unless you have literally a cancer, you have a big cancer growing. And what else did I mention? Uh, and Carter. I mean, you know, with talking about all this, since we're going to do multiple videos. FGH, FGH fragments. Yeah. On stacks. Um, I think the unique thing about tesafensine is it's kind of like a stack in and of itself. It is a stack in itself. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like you don't need anything else besides tesafensine. So, yeah, we're analyzing what could it be stacked with. But the truth is, like, I put, no, no, no. I but put the, these girls not... on tesafensine, they're losing weight. Like, I don't need to put them on anything else. No, no. So the studies show they lose weight by itself, mm -hmm. significant amounts of weight. I mentioned before in the original tesafensine video how significant they are. In fact, if I recall correctly, they're bigger than uh, semaglutide. They're bigger than semi. They're bigger than liraglutide, but not semaglutide. They're similar to semaglutide over here. Wait, yeah. wait. The problem is Tony is probably thinking about also the psychological effects. All of these drugs are one in like semaglutide is a one drug has everything makes you lose weight by itself. If you take the uh, semaglutide, my cousin just messaged me, told me that he was taking semaglutide for the last two, ten months to change his life. I wonder if you found it out from the channel, but I don't think so. I think because in, in the UAE and Qatar, they have a lot of di diabetic, obese populations. But trust me, I've taken semaglutide. If you cannot lose weight just from it, something's wrong with you. This would be a, not true. I don't know. Semaglutide as a standalone is not exciting to me. It's mostly just a decreasing it's appetite. far less dangerous. Yeah, but tesafensine is doing a lot of different things besides just to, I mean, tesafensine is increasing BDNF and, and yeah. neuroplasticity. So I'm saying in terms of the brain. Yeah, but yeah. it's it's it, it. Let's not exaggerate. It's it's so it can cause weight loss by itself. So can semaglutide, almost the same level. The question is, can it cause more semaglutide than uh, sorry? Can tesofensin cause more weight loss than semaglutide with naltrexone? And how much could they combine together because they're not working on the same systems? You know, but the semaglutide. I, I don't think you've experimented much with it. I have. I did. I just enough to make it feel. I cautious. have a prescription feel, for a year yeah. in my fridge in the U.S. I've taken it. Is it doing anything time. besides decreasing appetite? Why is it actually? It's an appetite suppressant. Loss? Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, you can't eat. Yeah, but that's not. But tesafensine is doing more than just not for fat loss. Very no, not suppressant. not for fat loss. No. Tesafensine is giving people energy. They're expending more energy. Yeah, See, but it's not, it, doesn't give you it's any not, energy. It's not going to be notice, notable like on clay. It's not going to be that powerful because this is in the brain. You're getting more locomotor activity a little bit. Yeah, you're I not going to get like if you're on math or if you're on clay. I mean, it, it depends Bro, on the I've person. I've been on look all at, of look these Look at AJ. AJ is freaking wired. He's probably never. He's like, he's like, he's burning calories. He's getting shredded so Maybe fast. because he needed, he has like a, a fast metabolism and he needed a 24-hour acting drug. Yeah. Maybe he took only Ritalin before and didn't take concert. Yeah. But I'm telling you, just for my audience to know, I always tell you my real experiences. Tesofensine is an amazing drug. It cannot be put above semaglutide. It is one of the drugs that most succeeded from the monoamine source. Because, guys, amphetamine used to be used to suppress appetite, legal, to prescribe for that. Ritalin was probably also, I'm not sure. But dextroamphetamine was as well. 
these things work. The problem is people started uh, being addictive to them. Serotonin stops that. The problem that they didn't think about is it could be neurotoxic. Serotonin also probably completely stops that. And these were the benefits there. And the heart rate was very high. The heart rate's lower on this one. This is Now you've got the actual monoamine system working for appetite suppression without being cracked out. That's the amazing benefit. Mm. It's tolerable. It has a bit of a, we'll discuss later, a bit of a withdrawal due to the long half-life, but the withdrawal is not, it's just a withdrawal if you don't know what's going on. I felt it's, it's no big deal. But semaglutide started a whole new approach to appetite suppression that doesn't affect heart rate at all, that is highly neuroprotective and extremely effective. I'm a person that's naturally fat. I've taken even luraglutide or dulaglutide, whichever the other one I took, was extremely effective to me. So was semaglutide, and I've tried all of them. Now, everybody has different neuroendocrinology, so you guys might respond differently, especially you guys that haven't used dopaminergic drugs much or long-acting ones. But we can't just say... The, the clear, obvious thing is, why don't you combine these? They're not interactive. Mm -hmm. This is going to be synergistic for sure. Mm -hmm. For the, I'm talking about for people that have serious appetite issues or potentially for people pre-contest. This is another thing about tensor density. Pre-contest is when they most need serotonergic signaling, but they have they, they don't have high dopaminergic signaling. Steroid users actually, I think, recycle dopamine and don't, don't have as well transmission long term, but they get a lot of adrenaline signaling, mm. which causes anxiety. Levels. This doesn't, it wouldn't really harm any of that too much and would protect them, but also inhibit their hunger. Maybe that's the only time I would think of taking it in addition to like clen or something like that. Mm. But I would, I mean, I wouldn't, I think, Pre-contest is dangerous anyway, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it's useful for that. It's very useful, but it's, it's a class that's been, they've been working on for a long time. They finally got something that really seems to work well. It has other benefits for the brain, but so does semaglutide for long-term brain health, but you don't feel better in, on semaglutide mentally. And desofensine doesn't really cause much nausea. Have you noticed that? No, no, no. Even at the one milligram. Semaglutide may be nauseous, but that's dosage dependent. You no, no, it's, it's worse than that. So when semaglutide is weakly, it's always, almost always dosage dependent, but either you don't get nausea in the beginning, and then you don't feel it for the rest of the week, so you have to take mm -hmm. another shot, or you get hella nausea, and then you have... So the daily semaglutide pills are probably better. I like the daily luraglutide, dulaglutide, whatever I was using. I had these prescriptions for a long time. I kept experimenting with them because they're so interesting. We one have both of, We have both of them here. In one the warning sign. Oh, really? Yeah, How much semaglutide and luraglutide. But one, one warning sign about that, I do believe that semaglutide, potentially combined with zetamide, but mainly semaglutide, I believe caused me to develop gallbladder stones. Gallstones are very easy to treat, though. I treated them with utka for a few weeks, and they dissolved because they were temporary cholesterol. I'll, I'll get into it later, but I do believe that semaglutide did that, do that, and I think I'm the first person who got it on video, but never talked about it. I wasn't totally sure it was the semaglutide. So there are some side effects there, but the real thing that if I was, if I, I would hope I would have learned this information before. If I heard it, I would be like, whoa, these are totally different pathways. And this one inhibits the negative feedback, naltrexone. So this is like amazing. Why don't I have all three? Mm. Mm. You know, yeah, if I'm really obese. Yeah. You won't be able to eat. You have to force feed yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, the, and the best thing about it is that when you go off them, the hunger comes back. So it's as like, opposed to permanently wrecking your hunger, you mean? Yeah, as opposed to like seriously damaging your hunger. You could, uh, your, your, I mean, the, your I have stomach will shrink. Yeah. Your stomach will shrink, but the mental hormones will be will be natural again. Yeah. But of course, you now have less fat, so you have less signals to gain fat and mm. all of that kind of stuff. But your brain is not being permanently changed, in my experience. Yeah. All oh, right, friends. This was great. Talk. Guys, we love the conversation. You know, if you guys suggest what you want us to talk about, we just talk about it. We could do this all day. Um, you know, Leo spends a lot of time researching, but then there's also we need to have time discussing it because that's when it really connects the research to the real world application. Be swole and swole, friends of freedom, pioneers of human evolution. A day natty is a day wasted.